To refounding. Uh, we are really excited to be interviewing Peter McLeod today. He's joining us from Toronto, Canada. And Peter is the founder and executive director of Mass LBP, which is an organization that has uh, put on a great number of citizen deliberations in Canada over the last uh, 15 years or so, I believe. And um, Peter has been a wonderful resource for us as we have been kind of figuring out uh, what the heck is going on with citizens assemblies and uh, everything else. So very grateful for you to join us today, Peter. Um, and I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit about the name Mass LBP, because it's not exactly clear from that what that means. Uh, no, uh, and, and thanks very much, guys, for inviting me on your show. Uh, yeah, you're right. This name, Mass LBP, where does it come from? What does it mean? You know, it's, it's probably entirely contrary to my organization's business interest that we pick something quite as obscure, but it has some significance to it. But part of it is practical. Despite the, the business significance, truth is when we're working on behalf of governments in Canada, we want to kind of blend into the background. We don't need anyone to remember our name. We're trying to help government put its best foot forward. And so if we can create a bit of a blurring between our identity and our clients, that's probably for the good. But the name itself, of course, invokes the, 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 the 20th century phenomenon of a, of a mass public, a world in which we don't know each other as well as we might have when we lived in smaller communities. And, and in that, that mass society, we need interlocutors. We need people and organizations that help bridge that distance. Um, now, there's also, of course, uh, Thomas Paine, who uh, wrote that there's a massive sense that lies in a dormant state that good government should quietly harness. And to me, that's always been a very stirring phrase. It's one that evokes, I think, a lot of our sensibility in the organization, um, trying to tap in to that latent capability in the public at large and ensure that people, as we like to say, have a hand in shaping the policies that shape their lives. So if you've got such a high-minded and lengthy description for your eminently forgettable name, you need a bit of whimsy. And that's where the LBP comes in. It just stands for led by people. And uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about the kind of work the Mass LBP is doing for people who aren't yet familiar with it and kind of, um, yeah, go a little more into what that's like? Yeah, I mean, we're a kind of unusual organization in that we are a, a, um, a private business. Uh, we're one that frankly acts much more like a, a nonprofit and operates with very high level of transparency, whether it's open contracts or open books for our team. Um, but our work as a leading democracy organization is to look for the innovations that can help address some of the crises that we face with respect to people's confidence in government today and in democratic society as a whole. You know, we got our start 15 years ago working to take what at the time was a very unusual breakthrough innovation that had occurred in Canada where randomly selected citizens were impaneled on what uh, was known as a citizen's assembly, and they were asked to advise the government on the electoral system. I was attached to the uh, Ontario citizen's assembly and overcoming my own initial skepticism became quite convinced that this was a, a mechanism, a process we should try and make more of our, in, we should make a part of our democratic culture. And so Mass has um, very quietly, very steadily uh, been running dozens of these assemblies on all manner of, of concern on behalf of governments. Um, but that constitutes about a third of our practice. There have been about 250 mass projects over the years. 
And broadly speaking, we take many of the skills we use to deliver the citizens' assemblies and and we, we use them to help governments address lots of complex policy challenges, uh, as well as nonprofits too. And could you maybe give an example of one of these assemblies in a little bit more detail? Because I think uh, we often talk about this in a kind of uh, theoretical way, but one of the things that uh, we've found very inspiring about your work is that you've gotten rather granular about what's happening uh, in every stage of these processes that takes place over the course of several months. Um, and I know that you've spent a lot of time on the process design element of it. So maybe uh, is there a particular case that you think would illuminate your approach to citizen deliberation? Well, the, the, the first thing I want to do for your, your listeners and viewers is just sort of demystify all this stuff that seems to always travel with its own handcart of complicated words. Um, we talk about deliberation, we talk about sortition, we talk even about these things called citizens assemblies. These aren't words that most people use in, in everyday speech. And the sooner, frankly, we can get away from some of these words, uh, the less exotic or special I think any of this work will seem. Um, rather, I think it's important to, to think about these as problem-solving processes. They're, they're problem-solving processes that involve the public in a meaningful way. And just as we elect people to represent us at local councils or state legislatures, we can also select citizen representatives to, to speak on our behalf. And so uh, Americans and Canadians alike are very familiar with the idea of, of, of jury and citizens assemblies, these problem solving processes, uh, begin with a similar mechanism uh, to recruit a group of people, far more than 12 men or, or women, uh, who can broadly speak for the range of concerns in a community. People are invited to volunteer, it's not mandatory. But then you randomly select from that larger pool of volunteers to ensure that the folks who actually sit in the room match the demographics of that community they're trying to represent. And so already we're doing something very different than a typical, say, town hall meeting where, of course, anyone who wants can come out and say their piece. And, and we know that's good because it's open, but we also know it's problematic because you tend to get out people who've already made up their minds or there because they're trying to defend particular interest. So the the ways in which the, the, the folks are brought into the room is, is really important. It's different. But then so is the task. You know, I, I describe this as a problem solving process. The government has tons of problems. You know, look at any issue, environment, health, transportation, um, economic development, human development, education. There are all kinds of choices that government is trying to make every day. Some of those choices aren't especially contentious, but many of them are. And so what we do is we invite people to, to work with experts and work with government to wrap their heads around these issues, not just come in sort of having already made up their mind, but having a chance to, to hear from a range of perspectives, including those in the room, and then it's not just as simple as, okay, ingest a bunch of information and then vote for what you like, tally it up and consider it a ball game. We ask these, these people to actually work together to find common ground and to speak with one voice, which means they need to find their way to a rough consensus. The problem they're trying to solve isn't just the policy issue. The problem they're solving is what everybody can agree to before you let them out of the room. And so that's, again, very different than how we typically go about democracy. When they have reached common ground, they end up writing out a series of recommendations, and, and those recommendations provide a mandate for that government official to, to take that tough decision. So you asked for some examples, and I'm not going to go on, but I'll just, I'll just say that if you fly into Toronto Pearson Airport, which I sincerely hope you do sometime, and visit us here, the time of day, the aircraft that you're on, the flight path that it follows has in part been determined by some people living close to the airport who are disproportionately impacted. Seems like a not uh, unsensible way to, to go about figuring it out. Uh, the introduction of supervised consumption sites for people who use um, uh, illegal substances 
the protocols, the parameters, the siting of these uh, facilities was in part determined by um, what we call a reference panel, but a, a citizen's assembly. Uh, we've had municipalities in Canada which have decided that they wanted to amalgamate because of the use of uh, these citizens' assemblies. We've looked at um, how uh, uh, um, condominiums um, are governed using these processes, and we, we've said about major healthcare reforms in this country because of these processes. They don't attract a lot of big headlines, um, and that's because they're usually without the sort of conflict that partisan politics uh, creates as a, a very consistent byproduct. Most recently, we've looked at a, a very controversial topic, and that's how we ought to regulate social media in Canada. And through the height of the pandemic, we had 90 Canadians meeting virtually and then ultimately in person in Ottawa, coming up with some very thoughtful ideas and that will be taken up in the federal government's forthcoming online harms legislation. So there's a world of ways in which these processes can be used, from things that are very local to things that are of national and international consequence. I, I, um, I, I love the um, example the, this, the one you told us about the airport, because we've talked about that before. And I'm wondering if you could dive in, if you, if you would be okay with that, into a little bit more granularity about that process. Because one of the things we've found, and one of the reasons we got this, this refounding series going, is there's a lot of talk about citizens' assemblies that you can find online about what they can do, or reference panels, or whatever you want to call it, this, this deliberative, sortition-based process. Um, but I think a lot of people, when you ask them, when you talk about it with them, they want to know how, what does that actual process look like the, from the time you, you, know, you choose the people. And, and you, I think, are one of the world's foremost experts on that. Uh, you definitely are. And so I'm wondering if you would, yeah, wouldn't mind breaking down that, just to take an example, the, the airport, and kind of walking people through what that more, with more granularity looks like. Yeah, so, uh, you know, before the pandemic, of course, um, airports in major metropolitan centers like Toronto, like LA, like New York, facing huge, huge growth curves. And we've seen already in Europe where airports have had to expand the very intense pushback that they get from their communities. Now, part of my job is to be impartial on these questions to try and see both sides. On a question like airport expansion, of course, it, it definitely serves the economic interests of not just the city, but the entire region or country. I mean, more than half of all air travel that occurs in Canada uh, comes through Toronto <clears throat> Pearson. So that's a, that's a huge consequence. But of course, there are other considerations right now in a moment of global heating and climate breakdown, uh, we also need to think about the appropriateness of providing the infrastructure even to make commercial uh, flight uh, viable. Uh, now we've got people living close to the airport. Well, you know, if you have more and more planes coming in overhead at more times of the day, that becomes increasingly uh, difficult. That said, there are about 50,000 people who count for their livelihoods who are employed at the airport. So, wow, what a constellation of interests. And, and how is somebody to know exactly what to do about it? And that's what prompted the airport, having watched this sort of pickle that a lot of other airport authorities found themselves in, to say, all right, we, we're going to sort of uh, farm this out to the community in a sense, because the public meetings we have, well, you can imagine who shows up. The folks who are living underneath the airport, they just want to shut it all down. But they're not speaking for the economic interests and a few environmentalists might come out. But do they ever have the opportunity to sort of learn more about the aviation industry? Anyway, there are a lot of considerations um, that were at play and we designed for those. So what we did was we sent out 10,000 letters to randomly selected households, having drawn on the map uh, three different zones based on proximity. And a lot of this is about using a kind of reasonable person test. I think most reasonable people would say that, okay, those folks who've chosen to live within a few kilometers of the airport, 
they shouldn't get to decide everything about the airport, right? But, you know, they should have more standing than maybe strictly their population relative to the rest of the region uh, might otherwise afford them. And then, okay, well, what about those at a, a slightly greater remove from the airport? Well, there will be a few people concerned about maybe the noise that it generates, and maybe they'll be more plugged into thinking about environmental or economic or employment issues. And, and then beyond that, another band of people. So we sent out letters. You know, one of the things that I, I think continues to surprise uh, journalists who cover this work and, and even our clients is that, you know, we, we, we tell ourselves that the public is apathetic. We tell ourselves that, you know, they won't even fill out your survey. What, you're going to ask them to give up 40 hours of their time over the space of four or five or six Saturdays to volunteer? What, you're not going to pay them and people are going to come from all walks of life? The reality, what we found, having sent 300,000 letters to Canadian households and run 40 of these assemblies, is that people are much more likely to volunteer and participate uh, than we would assume. My sense is that people have a, a very good, well, sense of smell. They, they know when something's real. They know when there's an opportunity for them to make a difference. And I think most people are motivated by kind of a similar drive to, to belong to something, to give something back, to make a difference. And these processes provide that. When people don't turn out to town hall meetings or fill out surveys, it's because they probably rightly assume that it's not going to make any difference. But if they're given the chance to really put their finger on the scale, uh, then people volunteer. So with the airport, we had hundreds of people volunteer. We chose 36 of them. It was half men. It was half women. It was balanced by age. Those three zones I mentioned also gave consideration to whether they owned or rented a home that was a proxy for uh, income. And you shake all this through and what you get is a group of people who absolutely look like the greater Toronto area. We developed a curriculum. We invited in um, acousticians. There's a word I didn't know before. People whose science is, is understanding noise. Uh, and, and noise can be very subjective. What bothers one person might not bother somebody else. We invited in some of the opposition groups that had formed uh, to try and resist the airport's growth plans. We brought in representatives from the federal government with Transport Canada and Navigation Canada from the airports. We had former pilots. Every perspective you would expect to encounter found their way into the room. And in a very short period of time, frankly, uh, this group kind of figured out what their priorities were, having counted up all the issues and concerns, and it, it sort of coalesced around a set of priorities, things that they thought needed to change. And then they, working in small groups, articulated exactly what should change. They wrote that up, handed it to the airport, and the airport has since folded that into their noise management plan. Um, now, the pandemic has been a discontinuity that nobody expected. Um, and so only now do we see the airport uh, getting back on track, dealing with some of those growth pressures again, and uh, now giving uh, greater force to, to many of the recommendations the citizens provided. Um, and did the airport ask you to do this for them? Was there some kind of... Uh like precipitating factor activism groups or something that forced this issue to a head? Absolutely. Um, the, the airport was the client. Um, in Canada, our uh, major airports are owned by nonprofit corporations um, that are effectively, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated structure, but there's a connection between them and the federal government. It's an arm's length relationship, uh, but they're effectively there to, to steward that asset, uh, the airport infrastructure for, um, you know, several decades. Uh, they invited us to, to run this process. And so the letters went out with the airport authorities logo on them. And yes, it had the attention of the Ministry of Transportation and and the political side of things, but it's being run by the airport. And the reason they wanted to do it is because they were getting a lot of pressure from some of these opposition groups. 
They weren't hearing from that silent majority that intuitively they believe might support uh, some of their expansion plans. And they looked with some trepidation to uh, other major cities um, where they had not been able to expand operations because of the strength of local opposition. So part of it was to, to get ahead of that moment and to try and identify what policies might be sufficient to address the concerns of the opponents, but also serve the sort of broader public interest as this group was able to describe. I see. Something I find really interesting about mass LBP is that even though you're working essentially uh, within what we would describe as democracy, a lot of the clients or organizations that you're working with are not necessarily uh, strictly kind of governmental, even if they're often associated with administration or something like, like an airport. Um, and I find that very inspiring because the reality is not everything in the modern world is organized by state legislatures or things of that nature. Although um, when the word democracy is brought up, it tends to uh, have these associations with the state. And the word that I often see you using and um, kind of disambiguating a little bit is this idea of the public. And that's a word that everybody uses in their day-to-day -day life, but we don't tend to investigate it very much. And in this field, sometimes uh, citizens' assemblies reference panels are referred to as mini-publics, uh, which is not, um, I don't see that used often outside of the, um, the theory literature so much. But there is this idea that the public might not just be this monolithic thing. It might be something that is kind of uh, constantly reassembling itself or coming into different uh, forms. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about your theory of the public or publics. Well, I, I think there are two words we actually have to pull apart here a little bit. The first one's democracy. And the second yeah. is <laughs> because I, I think we have conflated the idea of democracy to be purely synonymous with voting. And so what it means is that only when we vote are we being democratic, are we exercising our democratic citizenship. And the other 1,200 or so days between elections, we're doing something else, but it's not democracy. For me, democracy is actually how we make decisions. And democracy is an expansive project. It means how do we find a way to make room for as many people as possible at the table where decisions are made? And to me, it's, a, it's an inclusive vision of democracy, but it's also one that relies on the public being, being invited to do more than simply draw an X on ballot. So what do I mean by public? Well, part of the problem is that maybe as a consequence of almost 100 years of public opinion research, we, we all have this view of this public as this thing that is out there. And, and we know in our hyperpolarized times that the public is very divided. It seems like 50% of people want one thing, 50% of people want another thing. And so it has created this, this view that the public um, is an immutable force, doesn't change its mind about anything. And so you got to kind of play the margins and eke out those little gains where you can find them. And secondly, that the public is a largely apathetic force. Thing is that I, I think all of this is a myth. Uh, I think the public uh, is something that's actually created. Um, institutions create parties or, or, or publics. Uh, processes create publics. When we call people into an assembly, we're creating a public, just as we're creating publics when we call people into the voting booths. So part of the, the problem of, of the late 20th and early 21st century is that we have come to view the public, not only as this phantom, but we've come to view it as this thing that is, is actually kind of risky. Because look, if you go to enough town hall meetings, that are allegedly for the public. And a bunch of people come in who've already been, you know, haranguing state officials and have clearly made up their mind. You come to see the public as this, 
this, this force that is not only divided, but is actually really angry and is really emotional and volatile and not particularly well informed. And if, if you're that state or community official, and that is your only exposure to this thing that polling tells you is, is really divided and then it's in your face and in person, well, then you start to pull back. And we often see these measures of uh, trust in government. The measure I'd like to see is government's trust in people, because I'm pretty sure that both have been on a downward curve. And look, when, when people feel as though they're being excluded, when they feel as though they're being talked down to, they're pretty good at returning the favor. So we get ourselves stuck in this real feedback loop that uh, people seem threatening and foreign to government officials. Government officials seem threatening and, and foreign to the public and, and the whole thing starts to break down. And I think that crudely is a sort of description of where we find ourselves. Because of the work I've, I've had the, the real privilege of doing, my exposure to that public is a little bit different because I see the people who volunteer when they get a letter. And I see the people, even when they come from every political persuasion and walk of life, still come into the room and want to give something back. The publics we're able to create are pro-social publics. They're publics that are interested, not in what divides us, but what connects us. And so our prescription for democracy is to see that we create at scale the mechanisms that will generate the publics we need for the society we want. And when I say we, I'm not talking about me sitting here. I'm talking about a we that's a much bigger than the 48 or 49 percent. I'm talking about a we that is actually more like 70 or 80 percent because I genuinely believe that most people, when they have the opportunity to encounter one another, work from common principles, work from the shared information, actually have very similar instincts about what justice looks like, what fairness looks like, and how we can get along together. Yeah, I love, I love when you talk about the public is talking to our conversations with you have definitely opened my eyes to the, the, the public and thinking about it, you know, because we hear public think like public works or like public health. But you have you have this term, the public as a resource, rather than something to kind of be afraid of as a government, but something to kind of draw, you know, bring power and insight from. Yeah, we, we want it. We, the, the, we see the public as a risk. We need to see it as a resource. Uh, but I've got a lot of sympathy and a lot of time for public officials uh, who are a little bit scared of the public, because after all, the mechanisms we've been using whether it's polling that sharpens those divides, whether it's social media that you know, breaks us off into these filter bubbles and echo chambers, whether it's just crappy public processes that tell people to stand at a microphone in the midst of a room full of strangers and gets everybody so wound up that they can barely see straight, much less you know, express themselves. I, I, I don't think this is the fault of, of anyone in particular. It's just a syndrome that we're all a dynamic that we're stuck in. And by recognizing it, we can start making some other choices. We, we almost have to, to suspend our disbelief for a little bit here and choose instead to design for something that we want, but we can't quite see. Yeah. And that is certainly one of the goals of this uh, little interview series is just trying to show that uh, what we're talking about is not uh, so theoretical. It's not just a kind of coffee shop conversation. It's, there's some real methodology here, and uh, there's a concrete thing that we can be moving towards. And something that I just saw you uh, put into the public consciousness recently in an editorial was uh, an idea for a democratic action fund in Canada, I think is what you were calling it. Um, that would essentially help to uh, f make more of these kinds of deliberative processes uh, feasible by cost, because at every one of these panels, as I'm sure you know, costs some money. Um, and uh, you pointed out that in Canada, they spend like something like $630 million a year on uh, administering elections. 
and you're asking for considerably smaller amount. Um, so do you think that this is kind of the direction that uh, this movement needs to go in terms of uh, making it operate on a larger scale? Or maybe you can just speak a little bit more about that editorial. Well, let's, let's argue this one a little bit from, from first principles. You know, I, I mentioned before that for most people, democracy is something that you do every four years. When you go in briefly to a voting booth in America, you pull on one of those levers, I guess, and, uh, and you cast your vote and away you go. You get a sticker, which is nice. Yeah. I voted. Yeah, and you get a I voted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. And my daughter would love that. Fantastic. Um, but the rest of the time, we don't ask very much of people. And, uh, you know, America is an extraordinary country. It has this great civic tradition. It's got a great tradition of volunteerism, of people wanting to give back and, and help one another. Um, but the political parties and government writ large don't seem very skillful at tapping in uh, to that desire, um, much less capitalizing on it, making something useful from it. And I don't think that's because people today are oh so different than, than people in yesteryear. I, I think it's, there've been a number of forces that, that have contributed to this. So the idea of a democratic action fund is simply to say, hey, wait, uh, we're spending a lot of money every four years. What if we were to create a dedicated fund to ensure that we had the financial means to support public participation at scale between elections. Because there's more than enough money. You're right, in Canada it costs uh, almost two thirds of a billion dollars to elect 308 people in Ottawa. It's a lot of money. If we took just 5% of that, 30 or so million bucks and, and spent that, each year we could have almost 10,000 people involved in really substantive processes that would connect them to government. Most people know someone who served on a jury and they may not have had a good experience. I don't, I don't want to hold the US criminal jury system up as a paragon, frankly, of equity or, or, or democratic process. But Americans and most countries where there's a jury system their citizens still all express a lot of confidence in that process, in part because it, it matches our democratic intuition, right? The idea that you'd get a bunch of people who are disinterested, right? No relationship to the accused, just to, to help weigh out the facts of the thing and determine justice. My goal is the same. I want everybody to know somebody who's participated in one of these policy juries, um, not because I think it will completely restore confidence in our democracy, but it will give us an important and different experience of it. So we spend our two thirds of a billion running a national election, but I don't just want the national government to set up these funds. I, I want the state governments and I want the municipal governments to do it as well. And I know that in the US, you've got your midterms coming up. And I think the current cost of the midterms, not to run the electoral system, but just the advertising is somewhere on the order of $16 billion now. So America is a wealthy country and its political system is rich. And if we were to divert even a fraction of the dollars that are going into what we can all agree is largely junk advertising that is doing more to drive people away to politics than bring them to it, well, I think if we were to divert even a slice of that money, we could do a world of good. I fully agree with you there. Uh, and I do think that it's interesting that America, maybe it's not that surprising, has not really adopted um, citizen deliberation so much. I mean, it, it's just starting. Uh, whereas Canada was arguably one of the first countries to start doing it on a large scale, I think, in 2003 or 2004 in British Columbia. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we're on the same continent. Uh, we mostly speak the same language. Um, and uh, 
obviously people in Canada, I think it's fair to say, know a bit more about America culturally than and politically than uh, Americans know about Canada, unfortunately. Um, but do you think that America could uh, begin to see some of the federal level initiatives that it seems like Canada has been able to start doing with, with the work that you're doing? Or is there something kind of uh, unique about our democracy that needs a different approach? Well, let me assure you, the reason we do it up here in Canada is not just because we're so polite. <laughs> it's also the That's case wonderful. that the Europeans have been doing hundreds of these processes over the course of the last decade. In fact, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, the OECD, has put out a terrific report about these kinds of processes called the deliberative wave and has, has, has counted up uh, where they've been happening and, and what they've been addressing. So I, I can give you my few stories from Canada, but if you really want to be impressed, you go to a country like Ireland, where national assemblies uh, were held uh, legalizing same-sex marriage, uh, which led uh, most recently uh, to change the, the whole governance system for the city, the capital city of Dublin. Uh, I can go over to France, where the French president created a national citizens assembly uh, in order to make proposals that would go into that country's climate law. You can't take an airplane in France um, to some place that you can reach by high-speed train within two hours. And the reason why that policy was put into effect is because a group of randomly selected citizens empowered by the French government made that recommendation. I actually think America is absolutely primed to be a leader in problem solving with people, in part because everybody's so frustrated with politics as usual, right? Everybody sees on both sides that something has really slipped the gear and that it's just not working the way it should. And it feels like folks are in a kind of race to the bottom rhetorically, in ways that divide rather than unite. And Americans are good people. They know, and, and they're clever, right? They're good at finding solutions. So what it's gonna take is probably some municipal leaders first, right? Or some of these broader public sector leaders who, you know, are, are running um, uh, transportation systems or they're running uh, conservation areas and parklands or, you know, they're running school boards. And they say, hey, we've got, we've got a problem that we can solve better together. If we get lots of people in the room and we work on this problem together, we're not just gonna solve it until the next election. We're gonna try and build a consensus that lasts more than a few years. And, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came to America and then was so uh, utterly uh, transformed by that experience of of civic democracy uh, was picking up on something. I think that's very fundamental to the American political psyche. The idea that citizens, not the elite, are the ones who know best, can solve problems, the practical minded and, and, and kind of put down their baggage and sit together, right? It's not always pleasant, not always polite, it can be fractious, it can be hard, I don't want to leave you with the impression that these assemblies are all just, you know, uh, you know, rainbows. They're hard conversations. They're adult conversations. But what's important is that these processes provide a space for those adult, hard searching conversations to happen and for us to be able to break down conflict and build up understanding. So to me, that sounds like a prescription for the sort of sickness that's affecting American democracy right now. If we could get more people in the room together to work on things that everybody cares about, I think folks would stop feeling quite so set against one another and start seeing things in a similar way. Yeah, it makes me think of um, this 
and I'm not sure, tell me what you think of this concept, but this idea, you know, these, all these deliberations we do, these deliberative, process, deliberative processes we run, that you run, um, they serve a purpose in the short term in that they help us solve a specific problem or come to some consensus that has legitimacy and trust around the, the, the recommendation. So it serves a problem in the short run, but also it seems to me that, you know, just for example, in a town like Burlington of 40,000 people, if we were running a process like this every, I mean, you know, there would, if, in, a play, in a time where there's multiple of these going on at any one time solving different problems, it seems like, at least in a small place like this, the social capital that would be built by putting all these people who've never otherwise would have had a chance to develop relationships with each other, um, over the course of a couple years, that would be very profound. And, and it seems to me, you know, you, you'd have people who now know each other who never would have known each other. And that just seems to be a, would have an exponential effect, especially in a, in a smaller, in a smaller um, town. And, and just on that note, the, what the question I want to ask you too is if maybe, and we've been going into it this whole conversation, but I'm wondering if you could help maybe go into a little more detail too about the vision for this, what the world might look like 10, 20, 30 years. Um, what's, what's the vision? Is it, is it that, that we do that where it's just most of our problems are solved by these by these reference panels or by these policy juries, these citizens assemblies. Um, yeah, I'm curious where you're, where you're thinking, and I bet our viewers are curious too. Well, I, I think you're right about the the other stuff there. I, I I think these processes, you know, besides just getting better policies, I think they they pay out a kind of democratic dividend in the way you're describing that everybody knows somebody. And, and so it, as part of that democratic culture, it's a, it's a stronger culture. Um, and I think that's because it affects the individuals who participate in a very profound way. We, we like to talk about that at mass as democratic fitness. You know, we know what civic literacy is. You're supposed to like know about the founding fathers and how a bill becomes law, but, and that's good. But democratic fitness are things like, you know, moral courage, sense of personal and collective efficacy. Uh, one of the great American political scientists, Theta Scotchpaul, wrote a book maybe 20 years ago called Diminished Democracy. And, and she counted up, you know, just how many of the sort of traditional and, yeah, very middle class and, yeah, some sectarian you know, service clubs and, and other kinds of community organizations had, had really been washed away. And it's easy to think to yourself, oh, goodness, what, you can't say the prescription is like to, to, to join the sort of Wednesday lunch, you know, uh, circuit, except it was in those organizations where people had to decide what they were going to eat for lunch and who they were going to invite to speak. There were all of these little micro tensions and micro conflicts that people had to learn the skills of democratic citizenship to resolve. And I think it's not an original point to say that those kinds of organizations paid that democratic dividend into their communities. And, and it's right and proper that things should evolve and certain things should become obsolete, but we have to replace them with other new mechanisms uh, where that same kind of pro-social democratic skills can be taught. So what's the vision beyond here? I'm, I'm not a democratic solutionist. I'm not somebody who says, well, if everybody just did this, then our cynicism uh, about government would recede, that we never elect another fool, that we would live in some kind of democratic utopia. No, you know, at, at, at the most basic level, what I'm saying is, when we run all of these committees and task forces and, and other kinds of problem solving groups, let's just make sure it's not only the elites who get to sit on them. Let's create more of these kinds of committees and let's put everyday people on them because they'll benefit and will benefit. So it's not more complicated than that. What changes though is when you do bring it to scale. You know, we can look to other countries in this world and, and see that they have done a better job 
in sustaining and continuing to build confidence in government. Uh, and when we say government, we don't mean something that's away in Washington or up in Ottawa. We're, we're talking about the bits of government that frankly impact people the most. And, that, and that's local uh, and state government. Right. It, it's all those institutions that when we say democracy, we never really think about the school boards, um, the you know, transportation departments, all of the things that provide public services to us. So if we can take all of those public services, maybe that's even a better way than, than talking about democracy or government. But if we can just find a way to put the public, plug the public into public services in a much more you know, regular everyday way. I think those public services will work better. I think support for them will increase. And I think our communities will be stronger. And I think we might see some of this polarization um, recede, not vanish, but come off the kind of fever pitch that it has recently been reaching. Yeah, I think there's definitely a tendency uh, among us uh political dreamer types to want to think of the utopia and the um, the and certainly in, in, on the left wing there are those that would find this to be almost uh, kind of too um, unre unrevolutionary uh, to status quo um, and it's interesting to see in countries that had left-wing revolutions, uh, I think, in general. I mean, in the Soviet Union, for example, they did start out having a lot of deliberation in councils, but eventually it became very centralized and authoritarian, and there wasn't, there was, you, would, you wouldn't dare deliberate and share your real opinion on something. Um, and that is something that I actually really appreciate about living in the United States, however flawed it is, is that I, I can freely share my opinion on things and feel like I can deliberate with people and uh, with everything that's going on in the world today, we often hear democracy is under attack, we have to defend democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And despite maybe the, uh, the, um, uh, the use of that for ulterior motives, I actually think that they're, they are right about that. Uh, maybe not even in the way that they mean, but that we have at least the potential in the places that we live to exercise this citizenship on a basic level and take initiative. And uh, it's very inspiring to know that there are individuals like yourself out there who are uh, charting the course because, uh, frankly, it's not very well known still. Uh, and I don't think it's ever going to be successful if we come with our pitchforks and our torches up to the uh, gates of wherever and demand something. It, it really has to be uh, shown that it works um, on its own merits. And uh, I, I admire that you are able to um, direct the conversation towards this uh, constructive approach rather than um, something that continues the division, although I sense that uh, if this does ever get brought to scale, there will be some pushback. And do you think that uh, you seem to have had a lot of success in working with um, institutions that um, you know you wouldn't necessarily consider to be uh, very like um, you know willing to try really revolutionary experimental things? Yet what you are doing does seem in some ways to be that in a quiet way. So maybe as to, to wrap up the interview with this, I'm just wondering, like, um, do you have any advice for people who are trying to uh, get these things going in their own communities about how to talk about it, how to think about it in a way that's not divisive? Well, um, let's just kind of pull apart a, a couple of things that, that you said there. Um, the, the problem is that people, of course, are carrying pitchforks and are holding torches and are threatening to tear democracy down. Mm. I don't want to be hyperbolic, but the, the magnitude of the threat that all Western liberal democracies face um, is real and it's imminent. And the threat comes both from within, 
and from foreign actors like Russia and China uh, that are decades into an effort to destabilize our societies. Part of the problem is we just keep making it so damn easy for them too. We make it easy for them because we aren't actually working to mobilize this public as a pro-social, pro-democratic force. And the way we can do that is yes, to use processes like the ones I've been talking about this afternoon that give people a seat at the table, that don't keep them outside banging, asking to get in. And that will reflect the sort of, to some degree, less partisan um, sensibilities uh, that we have. But this is a radical proposition because I, I don't just intend for local governments be using these processes. I want to see schools use these processes. So, you know, student government doesn't become the kind of absurd popularity te uh, test that it often is, contest that it often is, and that at such a tender age exposes young people to all the worst lessons about <laughs> democracy, not just that the cool kid gets elected, but actually it doesn't matter if they vote or don't vote. It doesn't matter what they think about what needs to change or stay the same about their school. They just don't have a voice, right? Um, we can go so, uh, sort of sector by sector because I think the same sensibility applies within so many workforces where decisions are not made in anything resembling a sort of democratic or consensus-based way, it's all top-down. It's what the boss says, or worse, it's what the shareholders say. So by bringing people to the table, it's a very simple phrase, but it's a, it's a powerful one. Of course, Oscar Wilde also said that the problem with socialism is too many meetings. And I think, because, <laughs> hey, I, I do this stuff for a living. I don't want to spend all that much time sitting in rooms full of strangers trying to find common ground it's something i'm prepared to do at best episodically right maybe once a year maybe every few years but fortunately there are a lot of us so it doesn't always have to be you and it doesn't always have to be me we share this out and i think that's part of one of the that that is one of the challenges and the competition for people's time right now so people don't want to join the, the Rotary group because it's just too many meetings doing the same thing on and on and on with it, the, the kind of impact that people seek. There are other mechanisms, though, beyond these deliberative models to involve people. That might be the topic of another conversation, but I think the, the base note is to really look for how we can tap into the capability of our communities and you know get out of that loop where we're so afraid of each other and instead recognize uh, our talents generally our our desire to to try and get along and try to make things better and to to try and make a difference and it's going to require a lot more experimentation and it's going to require investment and it's going to require uh public institutions uh that remember who they're there to serve and are willing to bring those people to the table too. All right. Well, I'm aware that you're a busy man, so I'll let you uh, hop off. But thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. And uh, as always, very illuminating and inspiring hearing from you, Peter. So thanks for watching Refounding. Yeah. And we'll be back uh, sometime with yeah. somebody else. And I just wanted to say, I hope it's OK to just plug the class that we just took with you. Um, anyone who's interested in this should uh, is it? It's masslp.org. Is it? Uh, you'll find uh, it. Com. Dot com. Com. Dot com. There's a bunch of uh, great resources on there um, about how to run these things. And Peter also offers a course that uh, we highly recommend that goes into so much detail about this that is, is just so great. So thank you very much, Peter. Oh,